Well, we just did Autumn of Glory, but this Art of War annual has two bonus scenarios. One for Autumn of Glory and one for Lee Takes Command down there that I got kind of ready to set up. Um, I'm going to look at the uh, this one, which is the Battle Above the Clouds. I actually have a recent Great Battles of the American Civil War game on this that I have not tried at all. I've tried the one GBACW. I wasn't that thrilled with it and I'm kind of holding off. I'm gonna, not, not making my decision on them yet <laughs> entirely. Uh, so far I like this system better. It has its flaws, but I like this one. Okay, so this is handling the situation of basically the Siege of Chattanooga um, being relieved with Grant coming in uh, with a whole bunch of troops. You can see there are a lot of things here. You take a look at the uh, combat charts. There's a lot here, a lot less Confederates. In addition, it's got sort of a situation where uh, Knoxville is also threatened. And if you can remember, Knoxville was uh, the center. Um, well, Knoxville was what Burnside was chasing down. He's still there now. He occupying it. We got General Longstreet here. Bragg has what he has uh, facing Chattanooga, and he's severely outnumbered. Let's take a look at the rules for this game, the specific rules. Um, they build off of the Autumn of Glory rules, though. So um, we're going to see some places where Autumn of Glory is modified instead. Oh, uh, okay, so for the formations, the Union has six different formations in the game. Uh, the Army, Army of the Cumberland is two corps, both led by an officer as Thomas. Uh, the Potomac is led by Hooker. He doesn't have the whole, he just has a component of, uh, of the Army. Uh, the Army of the Tennessee is led by Sherman, but this is just one corps. So these two are one corps ones. So it makes sense that an army is in command uh, of a single officer. Thomas being in command of Cumberland is a little weird, except you have Grant as the overall commander. So he's basically got two corps, both under his command. That does not bode well. Uh, <laughs> it means that you don't have a leader. Um, you know, you probably, you probably don't want, um, each corps is a separate formation. Thomas can only lead one of them, but you can't mix them without causing problems. Uh, the Army of the Ohio is also two corps. They have specific leaders, Porter and Manson, and they're under Burnside over there. For the Confederates, they also have corps uh, formation, but it's fairly normal. They have uh, three formations for the Army of Tennessee, uh, Hardy, Breckenridge, and it looks to me like the Army of North Virginia contingent over here, um, who's under Longstreet's command. Uh, you can have a dummy cav equal to the number of real cav you have in play, up to the limit of the counter mix. You can use either dummy infantry equal to half of the number of real infantry. So this is something which is kind of weird. What it doesn't specify is what the counter mix is. <laughs> I think this, I think um, the expansion, first of all, it, one of the things I was worried about was how do you tell what's what apart? Well, all the regular pieces are all um, from the expansion. So basically I can separate out and they're not shared between the two battles. So you could actually separate out what you need for each battle with one exception. These counters up here, uh, a couple replacement major generals and the dummies. I think those dummies are enough to cover this battle. I'm not positive. <laughs> if they're not, I could dig into the other ones. What you don't have from, uh, for, for the expansion is all the sort of neutral markers. That's fine. You know, I don't mind those. Uh, those are easy enough to tell. I'm not so sure. I think I need these 
uh, army repositioning supply centers, but I'm not positive about that. We'll find out here and I can put them in the bags if need be. But that makes this much less of a nightmare to deal with than I thought it was going to be. I thought there were going to be units from the original battle in here, or at least leaders, and, you know, patchworks uh, of units where, like, maybe they didn't have the right strength on them or something like that. That's not the case. Uh, it can be segmented pretty nicely, even if not completely from the base game. Obviously, you need the map and the rules, <laughs> but, okay. Uh, the offboard game works the same as it always did, except the railroad connection between Cleveland and Athens is out of connection. Um, that's here. So this no longer exists. I should probably put something there. To remind me of that. Let's put this little yellow counter here. That's just to say, I can't make that um, transfer. You can still get between the two boards. It's just Cleveland is basically not in play. Um, I mean, I guess you could go off board to go through there, whatever. Okay. Lines of communication, um, the home areas for the Union, they have two different lines of communication rules. Uh, the normal group works off of 27 Bridgeport. Uh, so hard to find things in this game. So 26 is here, but 27 is over here. So I am going to put the Army of the Cumberland Supply Center here just to remind me of what, what's going on. Uh, the United States Army Command occupying areas on the uh, off-board track has, has to go back to there as well. If and when there are no Confederates in an area or adjacent to the area containing Memphis and Charleston rail line west of Chattanooga. What the fuck? Where's Chattanooga? West should be this way. I'm not seeing those. Let's read this again. Oh, if and when there are no Confederate units in an area with or adjacent to an area containing the Wem Memphis and Charleston Railroad. Uh, that's this rail line. Okay, so the fact that Lookout Mountain is held uh, prevents this from happening. Once that's cleared, Chattanooga then becomes the Cumberland supply source. So clearing Lookout Mountain is important. And well, it's important for other reasons. Um, and as soon as that happens, it's like in Autumn of Glory, you're stuck with Chattanooga as your supply source from, from then on. You can't revert or anything like that. So you could get screwed if you do things stupidly. Uh, area 33 becomes a Union home area. If you lose that, you can't revert back. Okay, the Union Army of Ohio has its center in Knoxville. Um, and if you lose Knoxville, you may have some serious problems by being out of supply. Okay. Uh, the Confederate home area is 61 Ringgold. A, it makes sense. They didn't lose it in my game and they didn't lose it historically. Um, if they lose that, they can fall back to Rome, and there's, I can use the marker for that if I need to. Uh, everyone on the offboard map has to be able to trace uh, back to Bragg to avoid the penalties. Now, um, that's normal line of communication rules. The line of supply is a little different. Um, the Union uh, Army Commander in Supply, uh, they can go back from the unit back to the home area, six areas or less. The Army of Ohio Infantry and Artillery are in supply if they can go back to Knoxville, four boxes or less. If Chattanooga becomes the Army Command News area, the line of uh, sight range remains. For the Confederate uh, line of supply, if for the Confederate line of supply, it no longer varies. <sighs> 
I don't think I had a, uh, an issue with that in the game that I was playing. I was usually operating close to my line of supply, to tell you the truth. Uh, Confederate infantry and artillery are considered to be in supply if they can go back uh, four areas or less to their home area. Knoxville is a spare home area if the Confederates can capture it. Uh, and if all the areas on the OBD and areas on the map connected by rail line are free of the units. Um, I may have trouble capturing it though, because let's see, 17 and 18, Jesus, 18's here, is gonna be my supply location. And I'm only allowed four areas. I don't see how these guys are in supply. Um, so this is one, two, three, four. I'm not in supply off Ringgold. So that's gonna be pretty tough. And all the areas on the OBD and the areas on the map connected by the rail line are free of Union units going back to the original. Okay. Uh, so I don't know how likely <laughs> how likely it is that I'll be able to take Knoxville without being in supply. Uh, so Longstreet probably wants to come home. Battlefield collapse. Okay, we have this rule for the Chattanooga uh, for the uh, Chickamauga experience. Well, here it's different. The Confederate it's still in play, but it's on the Confederate side because their army is very shaky at this point. Um, all battlefield collapse is exactly the same as Autumn of Glory, except for the Rebel strength point limit is only 20 instead of 40, and only on defense. And again, it happens once per turn. Burnside doesn't like to do anything still. Uh, he needs a 5 or a 6 to move one box on the OBD or on the map. Uh, however... The Army of Ohio is always free to go back towards Knoxville, and they probably were allowed to go back towards Montgomery. If Burnside enters the map or Grant enters the OBD and they're both in the same area, um, Burnside can go away and the Army of Ohio becomes part of uh, the Union um, Army. It, it really becomes two separate corps, each directly reporting to Grant. Um, there's a bunch of sections that are removed from the Confederacy handling that, there was a little chart that I was using there uh, for the rules. Here they have a normal um, operation. The Cumberland Gap, uh, it's occupied by, it's considered occupied by Union forces. Saying that when there's no forces there is weird and like, but it makes me a little more certain that the occupation rule is correct for this because if that's considered occupied without any forces, that's different than it's considered, you know, owned or anything like that. But I don't know. Um, if the Confederate player occupies it, it becomes rebel territory, the Union will have to retake it. It doesn't say anything about remaining in occupation, so I, I have no idea, but I don't know what it'll do. Uh, weather. Weather's the same as before. Um, we have a different turn record track, but I'm gonna approximate it over there. By using random weather, that's fine except there will never be heat. Um, all rules are in effect and there's sort of a, I, I'm just going to go with the straight weather die roll because the actual weather is not very rainy and like the first five turns of the game in, in the other, uh, in Autumn of Glory are likely to be rain. Um, so I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna modify that. So the victory conditions in this are uh, more standard for the game system. You get points for, for casualties and stragglers. Uh, ineffective divisions give you more points. Chattanooga is worth five. Knoxville is worth five. The Cumberland Gap is worth a point. And that's for the Union. For the Confederates, it's likewise, but the points are a bigger, you know, they get more for um, any of the, they get uh, less for causing casualties, well, for ineffectiveness, but they get more points for causing um, for, for taking Chattanooga or Knoxville. Good luck with that. <laughs> uh, we don't have anything that indicates what you need to win, so I'm assuming, you know, whoever has the most points. Uh, the unions on the... 
They kind of have the impetus for attack, although they have sole occupation of both Chattanooga and Knoxville. So they could probably win by doing nothing. <laughs> so again, there's kind of a, hey, is this a balanced and fair game? The Confederates are not going to be able to take these things. They're outnumbered. And what's going on? I, I don't know. <laughs> In this one, unlike the last one, uh, the victory conditions don't drive you to do anything. Um, so I don't, you know, I mean, the way it looks, the Confederates have to launch an attack on Chattanooga, probably fail, and probably lose the game within the first couple turns if, if you take these under any kind of consideration, in which case... I don't know what happens. I just don't know. Historically, I don't think uh, the Confederates did any kind of assault. There is a special rule here. The Union has to have at least mutual possession of Lookout Mountain in order to attack Missionary Ridge. Um, if the U Confederates move into Chattanooga, they must attack, and if they don't drive the Union out, they must withdraw, just like crossing a major river type of rule, which is why you don't want to do that shit. Um, and it looks like the optional rules may be allowable, but only one of them. The only one that's allowable is 12.1, which is the entrenchment rules, and we will be playing with them. I don't know how much they're going to do. This does not look like a terribly interesting situation. There's not a lot of uh, opportunity for maneuver. The victory conditions don't really stack up much. I'm really not sure it's worth playing at all, but we'll try it. <laughs> Hopefully the uh, Grant takes command over on the Lee takes command board. It looks a little bit more interesting. This looks like something completely boring. Actually start playing. I do want to point something out about some of the setups. So the setup for this campaign has really both uh, both players sitting with formations kind of intermingled in an ugly sort of way um, where you couldn't put them all in one wing because you'd get the multiple formations in a wing penalty but you know you don't have their leadership where it belongs etc. So that's uh, that's kind of an issue. Looks like Union player plays first I'll start pushing some pieces around, see what happens, but I don't expect this to be too much of a, of a good uh, good variant. Burnside got the right to move. Hey, I forgot to, I didn't put the S on the end of his name this time. Um, so I'm doing a bit of indirection there, so the Confederates can't be sure what's going on. You know, am I moving most of the army this way? Maybe some cav going up that way, what's going on? Through some, at least some of the forces are here, but that might convince the Confederates to attack, whatever, I don't know. Uh, I could have put more dummies down. Uh, the biggie, though, is gathering a couple of commands to launch an attack here on Lookout Mountain. Now, granted, the Confederates are on a lot of bonus here, but they haven't had a turn to dig in yet. <laughs> Um, I'm not worried about the gun pits. I'm just going to use standard entrenchment there. Uh, should I? Should I not? I don't know. Maybe maybe that shouldn't be allowed and I should roll for the gun pits because there's nothing that says that I shouldn't. So I'll take those away and not allow entrenchments. Uh, Sherman moving his forces into play. There's not a lot the Confederates can do to outflank me. They're really just... I don't know what they're doing. <laughs> I just have no idea. Um, Bragg's forces are spread out too much. I got to get these guys back on this map or these guys over on that map where they'd be out of supply and unable to do anything. So there's not a lot of question there. Uh, the fact that 63, 1, 2, 3, 4, which could have gotten us close to being in supply, <laughs> is not connected. Um, well, the fact that this Cleveland to Athens route isn't connected is just, you know, I don't know, I don't know what those Confederate forces are supposed to be doing, but they got to, they got to leave. They can't be where they are. Um, but the rest of the, the rest of the Confederate forces, well, we're going to be playing on this map, obviously. Maybe some kind of trickery could get you Knoxville. Um, looks pretty unlikely. I don't know if Burnside ends up way out of position or something. Who knows? So I got this one big battle. Me missing from these rules is 
an unbalancing factor to the victory conditions? I mean, yes, there is a little bit of that in the, if the Confederates get either of the key cities that we're looking at here, uh, they probably pretty much win the game. That's one unbalancing factor. But the truth of the matter is they're on the defense of um, somehow the game should be giving them something to allow. So Grant's goal here is to destroy the Confederate army. <laughs> Um, the Confederate Army of Tennessee should be destroyed. Now, historically, that didn't happen, but it does get, you know, battered pretty badly. So there should be something, some kind of victory point skewing that makes it so that the Confederates really don't have to um, match the Union <laughs> in victory points, even though they get huge bonuses off of capturing a city. That's not really, that's a fantasy scenario. There's nothing that indicates how you win. So my assumption is you win by having more victory points. But that may not have been the intention. The intention may have been, hey, if you're like at negative four or less or negative six or less or something like that, you're fine. Um, it should actually be a fairly big negative because the Union sole possession of Chattanooga and Knoxville is right away worth 10. Um, there's a good chance that they're going to have that. Uh, but anyway, uh, that's that. Because the Union wants to get things before the Confederates dig in, we're actually assaulting with both of our units. So we're going to do this one first, an assault versus a stand. And we have 21 strength points up against 14. That gets us a one-to-one. -one. The assault versus stand means that we're on level three. We were on the one-to-one, -one, we dropped down one. One-to-three means two Union losses, one Rebel loss, not being absorbed by any fortifications. And now we get to roll the dice. And it, this is the thing. We hope to be able to make that whole force ineffective by the end of this combat. <laughs> or make them withdraw, you know, they're caught. Uh, so now, what did I say, 21 to 14. That puts me here and here. And no modifiers for anything for leadership. And the Union does a big two and the Confederates do a big one. So both sides take a big three hits. If there were any leaders available, they would have been hurt. Instead, we're gonna just be doing those hits. Now, Stevenson, is already a good distance of the way towards becoming ineffective. I counted up the total Confederate uh, strength points before the battle. It's only 15, so um, not not quite enough to make that uh, check. And over here, I don't know what the Union's got? Hey, we got a leader. <laughs> um, Union's got 11, 16, 17, 18. To Confederate, 12, and 6 is 18. 18 to 18 is 1. That's going to be another 2 to 1 casualty ratio. And you can see there are times when it is worth taking more casualties potentially off the CIC um, just because you need to press on faster. Uh, so what did we say we brought? 18 to 18. That puts us on this column with both with a shift in the Union's favor. For fighting Joe Hooker, which I'm told comes from uh, a news, a, 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 a telegraph thing um, where the punctuation wasn't put in. It was, supposed, uh, it was supposed to be fighting exclamation point. Joe Hooker and his corps, you know, engage, and the exclamation point was left off. Another good roll for both of them. That's going to be two hits for each. Well, that's enough for a leader loss check for good old Joe. And I don't remember what the die roll is. It's like a one or a two or something. Yep, one or two with the numbers of ones we're rolling here. We'll probably kill them all. No, all right. The point to being here was to make the Confederates hurt. Um, so I think we're going to see the same things happen now. Um, I don't think the Rebs want to withdraw. 
uh, and they sure don't want to counterattack. So we'll see a very similar uh, setup where we have 2 1. Is that enough to knock Stevenson out already? Not quite, but almost a certain. Um, but yeah, you know, the Confederates want to charge them as much as they can. Now, they do not get to leave if they don't withdraw. That's okay. <laughs> Forces the Union to stay there and attack them one more round, and ineffective units will have to withdraw. So, um, there you have that. Uh, so yeah, we took care of those damages. I don't know what the numbers are like. It was three and three here, so this was uh, 1621 minus three is 18 to um, eight. Oh, we're actually on the two to one, shifted down one. It was only one and one. So we've improved our situation. And again, the Confederates want to hold this and cost the Union as much as possible on it. Uh, so what were we on? It was like 18 to 8, I think. And the Union does lots of damage. The Confederates do not. So that is two more hits to the Confederates. And Stevenson now gets an ineffective marker. Other side, uh, 16, 17, 18 was the base. I think I lost four, so that should make it 14. And Chatham, I think, lost three, so he's at six, and six is 12. So that is one to one, and that will be two Union hits to one Confederate hit. Again, if you know what you're facing, you can make these kind of judgments. Uh, so what were my numbers? It was like 16 to 12. No, 14 to 12. Okay, uh, so 14 on the assault puts me here. Not a good place to be. 12 on the stand puts me here. There's a union advantage though. And this time it looks like it's going to be one hit on each. Interesting choice. Chatham right now could take one hit and leave himself uh, not ineffective and take a hit on the core artillery. Overall though, I'm not going to be able to hold up against what I'm facing. I don't think reinforcements are going to work for me. Uh, <laughs> so my feeling is take the hits on Chatham, let him become ineffective as well and try to keep that artillery for as long as I possibly can. This scenario feels kind of like a, gosh, um, what, what is the point behind it? As again, it, without some kind of victory point uh, balancer, it doesn't make sense as a, how do I win, how do I lose? So then you gotta kind of start saying, okay, well, what's it about? With, one of the things that I could see it about is, uh, why it exists in any sense is a hey how would the system work if it's really unbalanced <laughs> in terms of the situation does it play out in a reasonable fashion um my feeling here is bragg should be saying you know what i can't take chattanooga i'm getting out of there and i'm kind of thinking about just doing that uh, let's fall back let's try to keep our army together what's the point there's no reason to try to take uh, Chattanooga there might be a reason that we can get it if we start leaving um, one of the problems the terrain situation means these guys can't even withdraw that way but I'm allowed to do a general retreat and just run away towards Ringgold and that kind of works with everybody <laughs> like, that is kind of what I want to do with my army uh, especially these guys up here, they weren't even in command anywhere. Uh, I don't think they're in supply. They're actually, there was a real problem there. Maybe this is not thinking the game correctly, but let me see. Let me see if they were in supply. One, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, barely. Uh, no, they're only allowed a four space supply. So they should have been halved in strength there as well. I'm not going to go back and fix that. Uh, I am definitely doing the general retreat. I just, I don't see uh, Bragg's position as tenable. And I want to get Longstreet out. What the hell? That opens up the Army of the Cumberland supply source as well. 
And this is just what we have going on. Uh, from Loudoun, I gotta go up through Decatur. I could have gone up through Kingston, but you know, that puts me at risk for being attacked. This way I think I get out of there without as much danger. Of course, I could get attacked across the major river. Oh, but, yeah. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but the Confederates are in a hopeless position at the beginning of this scenario. I mean, these units that got attacked, they were out of supply. They weren't entrenched. Um, they're just screwed. <laughs> Looking through some of the historical commentary, yeah, I read through it quickly, but, you know, I'm looking at this. So, this was the line that caught me. This is all previous to the game in October. Bragg realized he had lost his opportunity to take Chattanooga and decided to weaken his forces by sending Longstreet and Wheeler against Burnside at Knoxville. Uh, the move concerned Grant and Washington officials. Uh, Longstreet's not powerful enough. He's out of supply. He can't do shit. There's nothing in the rules that gives him supply. Um, he therefore uh, ordered Thomas forward 23rd of November to seize Orchard Knob and Indian Hill, uh, the chief outpost of Bragg's Missionary Hill position. This is what's happening on this first turn, but it's supposed to happen on the fifth turn. Why wait? You know, obviously, why wait if there's the entrenchment possibility? But boom. And as far as I'm concerned, the campaign is over in terms of like being able to win this scenario. It's just a matter of playing this out uh, in some kind of role-playing type sense at, the, at this time. I don't think there's any way to win this as the Confederates. And Lookout Mountain also presents a pro problem for the Union. Um, there's no way off Lookout Mountain to here. Uh, um, leaving Chattanooga, now that it's my supply source, is dangerous. <laughs> The Confederate to protect against the Confederates, I gotta hold both those spaces. I think I can do that, um, but yeah, it's not trivial how I'm gonna get out of there easily, you know, and safely. So I could screw off and cost myself, you know, Chattanooga possibly and the game. Then I make sure I keep some guys in Chattanooga. Um, I could have forced March down to Rossville. Not interested in that. Uh, just doesn't seem worthwhile. Um, over here, Burnside got another move, and he's pushing forward. He's allowed to be in supply within four spaces of Knoxville, I believe, so he can pretty much stay on the off-board map wherever he likes. And putting some potential threat. Um, maybe Longstreet wants to launch an attack back. Is he in range? I don't think so. Um, no, because what have we got here? We can't go through 26. I mean, this, it just screw it up even more. So I'm looking at 18, which is way up here. That's the closest one. And we counted that one, two, three, four. That's the maximum range. So I gotta get off map. I have to get back on map before I'm in range of my supply lines. The, the Confederates have to withdraw because they're ineffective. I know that <laughs> as the Union. I also know that how many strength points they have, which I can just quickly look up. That's two, four for the rough terrain, plus the artillery, which is another four, except they're probably doing the withdrawal shit. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, so yeah. Um, so it's two, four, plus four. They have eight strength points. What do I have? And I can calculate the entire battle out, basically, other than the die roll. Um, here. So I have 16, 17, 18 minus 4 is 14. And I don't remember what we said they had. I think it was 8. Uh, so I'm only going to be on the 1 to 1 table again according to me. Which is not a table I particularly want to be on. I'm going to have a shift against. And they are going to be providing no points which means I could either take a point of damage or not. I'm going to do a diversionary attack uh, to avoid that loss. <laughs> Even though it means I'm pursuing a little less effectively. So let's see what I have. One, two, four, and four is eight. Yeah, it's the one-to-one, -one, no effect there. So eight for the Confederates on a withdrawal, which is up here. And I don't remember what I said, 14, I think. 14 for the Union on a diversionary, which is only here. Thomas gets me a shift, so it's 7 to 15. 
that does a hit and that does a hit so both sides take one hit and then the confederates have to take straggle losses uh, due to the withdrawal and they'll be falling back to here just like as if they forced march which they could not do to get out of there and the rebels uh pull back everywhere it, consolidating my forces here in case the union wants to try to be tricky um, that's only defensible terrain it's not rough you might want to press to try to get further um, again my feeling is i don't know what this game is meant to represent and i'm just gonna play it out shooting from the hip with what i want to do and Longstreet running away trying to find supplies because he certainly can't fight without them and is again mystically capable of keep moving <laughs> Uh, and then over here, we see spreading out. Uh, see what the rebels do about this, because now we're being threatened from here. I've got to do the fallback, but I'm trying to hope to get these guys out of there. <laughs> okay, so we fell back to here instead of Chickamauga, because maybe we can slip back that way, get those guns saved. This way the Union can't force March to reach me. They could have forced March to here and attacked me. Uh, I'm far enough away now. <laughs> Got a little bit of safety there. They could force March to here though, so that's a danger. Um, that's life, you know, whatever. Uh, I got artillery with me, so I can't force March. Um, and then uh, over over here we've got Longstreet showing up so kind of the goal is what do we want to hit first we want to hit one of these two two segments and not both and Longstreet presents something of a threat to the Chattanooga sector so I've got to be a little bit careful here I can't just you know go charging after the Confederates Burnside is not moving <laughs> he's all alone over there um, and the Union's decided to try to cut the line. This is actually the Army of uh, the Cumberland here. Army of, Tennis of the Tennessee is sitting here. And uh, the Potomac stuff is chasing these poor fools. Um, really what they're doing is they're shifting over to this direction. But, yeah, whatever. I would love to catch them, but I don't see being able to do that. My hope was... The Burnside chasing from behind, these forces moving up, good stuff would happen. Uh, Burnside isn't linked up though, so, you know, <laughs> he's not going to be able to move most of the time. And the Rebs start dropping some entrenchments, trying to move Longstreet down. We don't want to force march in the rain. We might be in some danger here, not being able to, to hook up. Um, <sighs> maybe I need to force march. He's just got too far to go, and it's because of this damn thing. Whatever happened there is terrible. I don't know who blew that thing out, but that's that's a big part of why the reps are in trouble. Yeah, I think I'm going to force March uh, Longstreet's force. The problem with that is it's rain, and it's only the first turn of rain at least. And, you know, I got to roll for every unit, including the artillery, which is not good. Not sure. I think the art, I'd have to look it up, but I think the artillery takes actual losses when they straggle, uh, which would make sense because you're leaving guns behind or whatever <laughs> under those circumstances. Um, but I got away pretty lucky given the circumstance. Um, in fact, Jenkins, who was a higher strength thing, managed to roll a one, the only number he wouldn't straggle on. And McLaws. Um, took one straggler, which is the most you could take, but it's not that bad. Um, I put the straggle marker there to let me know that I straggled last turn. That's an additional penalty for trying to march again, but I really needed to get down here. Otherwise, the Union could block me and pretty much prevent me from getting through and then kind of hold me on, in place. So it was a necessity. On to the next turn. Union marches Thomas in no rain this time uh, to prevent a quick push through that means Longstreet has to attack if he wants to cut his way through now luckily he is in supply now which helps a great deal but he's not in the best of shape um, Sherman guarding Chattanooga itself 
with the hooker coming around, ignoring this, more blocking any kind of weird outflank going on. Burnside got to move again. Active little bastard this game. And I don't know what the hell to do with my rebs. Up a bit, I guess. I'm going to leave old Pete over here on defense. He's in supply. This is about as good as I can hope for. Uh, and he will entrench. I don't know how many units he has. If he has enough, he can... Two, three, four, five. He can actually build two entrenchments, and he gets his straggler back, too. So He's got cav with him, even. Um, could I use that cav for anything valuable? Yeah, hey, maybe a threat against Chattanooga from the north. But I would rather have the strength points, I think. And uh, here's the biggie. Breckenridge, this is, is marching forward. Now, I'm going to throw some dummies on the board to make things less obvious what's going on. Two encounters left for the Union at this point. Uh, um, tightening up my defenses here. And I'm not moving into here, not attacking. Burnside, I think, has just linked up. I'm not sure. Uh, I gotta look that up. Cause, I don't know. It depends on where Grant is. If Grant is in here, uh, I think he has, but again, I gotta look it up, and I could move Grant into there if he's not yet. He's not there, so I don't have to look it up. <laughs> um, because now Burnside does still have to make his roll, and de 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 de. I'm actually in supply through Chattanooga. Barely. Mm, not barely. I could even go this way, right? One, two, three... Nope, no road going up here. So it's gotta be it's gotta be this, but the Confederates aren't mobile. And I don't know what the hell they're gonna do. Um it looks like Longstreet's about to be destroyed. And maybe his only way out is to launch an attack on Thomas. Okay, so what is our attack gonna be? <laughs> Assuming the Union's standing, anything else would seem weird. Uh we're leaving our entrenchments to attack. Uh, weather's normal. I'm assuming we're going to be looking at one-to-ones. We just want to be fighting to get out of there. So diversionary it is. Okay. Uh, we get to choose which wing we want to hit first. I don't know. We'll hit the left wing first. And make our choice on that. And we got Longstreet. Hey, Longstreet attacks. He's got a quite a powerful little force here. Oh. Let's see. 12, 16. Oh no, 12, 14. Diversionary only gives you times one. 14 and 6 is 20. 2. Uh, 14 and 8 is 22, because they're multiplied by 4 for standing. So 20 to 22 is going to be that. Um, we are doing, we did diversionary versus stand, that's a 1. We're on 1 to 2 with a shift against for defensive train, Confederates take a hit. Yeah, nothing good happens here. Um, okay, and we're both going to be on maximum chart. No special cab or anything like that. We're going to fire on these guys. Okay, the Rebels do two hits. The Union does one. So both sides are going to take two from this little round. Recording losses. I had to go look up a roll because of this. Um, so... <gasps> You can't take an effective infantry and haul all the eff until there are no more effective infantry left. You can't take non-infantry until each infantry has taken a hit in that round of combat. Which is the important thing, because although normally you wouldn't want to take artillery or um, cav losses, uh, artillery because it's stronger than the infantry in general, cav because 
it usually provides you with some really nice capabilities in this system um, that I probably am, well, that I definitely am not using to full extent in this scenario, uh, but that I probably don't use properly anyway. But because the calf is halved, because I'm trying to hold Ringgold or whatever and get my army together in some some form or another, I'd be willing to take cav losses in this one. However, I had to take a loss on each of the two Confederate units. But now I can take losses on the cav, which I probably do want to do. On to the next uh, side. So, that means I'm at 10, 13, 14, 15. Does that make sense? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> 12, 15, 16, 17. I don't know. I don't know if 17 was what I should have been at. I feel like I screwed something up. I feel like I was rolling on the wrong chart or something. And it was only to the Confederates' advantage and they need everything they can get. Okay. So let's look here. Um, we're going to take the same thing that we took before, which is one hit from the comparison. Well, not necessarily here. Uh, 10... 12, 15, to 7, plus 20, 27. Yeah, it's one, 1 to 2 with a shift against. We do take the loss. And now we don't get to shoot, but the Union does over on the maximum chart. Um, and they have the defensive advantage over Longstreet. So... That doesn't really matter because I'm all the way over. Oh no, it does matter because I'm here, so I shift to there. Yeah, I think I cheated. Uh, that'll be another casualty. So that's two more against the Confederates. I will take these against uh, against the Cav units. Now, the question is, do the Union want to turn things around? If they do, the Confederates get to fling themselves back into their entrenchments. That doesn't seem wise. Uh, on the other hand, if the rebels get to move, which they will on their next turn, but first I get to smash them. Yeah, I hold. Nasig has made a, a statement along the lines of, you should be able to tell who won a battle or whatever from the outcome of the game and who won the game, moreover, for that. But this is clearly the case where that, that doesn't make sense. You know, I may be able to accomplish something that's better than what Bragg accomplished by not fighting the battle at Chattanooga. On the other hand, well, if fucking Burnside hadn't been so active, um, this wouldn't be the problem that it is. I, he was ridiculously active, and maybe he still will be. But, um... You know, the idea of withdrawing from this field may be the best solution that there is. And the only Union victory might be badly damaging or, and or destroying the Confederate Army of Tennessee uh, and the Northern Virginia uh, First Corps elements or whatever it is Longstreet's in charge of here. Um, you know, it, it's the kind of thing where there are games where there's uh, victory conditions that have to be, you, you have to express them in a numerical format to be able to decide what's going on. Sure, you're playing a tactical battle of Gettysburg or you're playing, you know, certain um, operational situations. It may make perfect sense what the victory conditions are. In this one, I would really love to have victory points that like allowed me to have a fair chance of winning but also you know assessed <laughs> with either side but also assessed uh, things in a way that was reasonable and that um, that ends up driving the game and that, that's where things get tricky and, and you can't just say the well it should be obvious who won not every battle is evenly matched sometimes you know <laughs> Sometimes they, they shouldn't be. All right, uh, on to the next one. It doesn't move. We're gonna have, I think, the entirety of the Army of the Cumberland hitting 
Long Street there and see if they can do something as nasty as they did, uh, well, as was done back here on Lookout Mountain where I can just smash the enemy. Again, they're in supply. There's nothing I can do about that. I can't move down here, cut that off. I got nothing. I don't have troops that can walk through the mountains or anything. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a big deal that Burnside didn't come in. If he had come in, that would more or less guarantee this. I feel like I gotta do damage, so I'm gonna be doing an assault. And I'll hit this. Oh, that's not what I meant. I meant a withdrawal. <laughs> okay. So, and yeah, I'm going into a lot of detail on the battles in this. I'm not sure why. It just feels like the right thing to do with this game somehow. Um, okay. So the Union, 21 and 28 is 49. But this is the 14th core. 49 minus 2 is 47. Let me write these suckers down. 47 to 12. So withdrawal, that's probably only times 1. No, it's times 2. 12, 14, 16. And there's 5 of these. 21 minus... Okay, to 19. Okay, 47 to 19. That sounds like 2 to 1. I got a shift against for the terrain. And we did uh, an assault versus a withdrawal, which puts us to 2. Which means the Union takes a hit for that. But again, I want to do the damage here <laughs> for various reasons. Um, okay. So now, 49 is just so far off the chart with an assault that we don't have to worry. But the other side is 19 with a withdrawal, but I got a shift in my favor for better defensive leadership than the offense. So we're on 1 and 3. The Union barely scratches them. The Confederates do a hit to the Union on a 1 or a 2 we damage the entrenchment, which we do not. That's a problem because it means these guys probably aren't going to be able to do any damage. A lot less strength points, and I should have really shifted those over. I don't think it matters. 16, 21, 25, minus, deet, 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 deet. 25 minus 5 puts me on the 20 table. Not quite as good. Uh, yeah, I should have had my artillery shifted. And we're still on the 19 table here with a withdrawal. It shifts us to here. So we're on the 2 and 3. Um, I caused a loss to the Union again. This, this was actually 1 to 1 shifted down. The other one was better than that. But it's still the same effect. And this time we get a little bit better effect. But it's not enough. The Union takes another second hit, and the Confederate entrenchment takes a hit. That's round one. The Confederates withdraw after that and take straggle loss. Got lucky. Um, they, got to, they got to save the artillery from taking losses, so I don't have to look up that rule. And now it's their movement. Um, I think I build an entrenchment here, I fall back, and honestly, I would say that I can kind of call it here. I mean, I have the choice of fighting out a nasty, ugly battle for what's going on here, or... Um, I can just keep falling back towards Rome. I don't see this as a defensible position against all these armies. On the other hand, if I start moving down towards Rome, um, and I'm kind of careful about it, there's no way the Union's going to catch me. And I am just going to stop it right there. <laughs> I don't see much point to this scenario except to highlight, you know, how this system works under this particular situation. 
I don't find it a particularly interesting situation anymore. My feeling with Bragg is being this far forward doesn't make sense. This is not a defensible line. I'm far over, uh, overwhelmed in terms of forces, and there is no way the Union can get Rome. <laughs> you know? So I can fall back, reorganize my army, and figure out what I'm going to do from there, which probably means sending Longstreet back to the east, letting the Army of the Potomac stuff go back to the east, and just fight on the schlag in the west. Uh, you know, I could go through the, mechani the mechanical aspects of it. Uh, another, another option would be to stand and fight and let the Union smack me. That also isn't likely to be too conclusive. Just because of the numbers involved, we're going to start seeing some big pounding. I don't really like fighting out battles that much. So, <laughs> uh, again, let's let it go here. What's ineffective? Well, the Confederates had two... <coughs> Two units uh, dropped in effectiveness, Chatham and Stevenson, the two that were caught on Lookout Mountain and couldn't do a damn thing about it because the way the terrain is built, maybe this wasn't realized, uh, but they had no way to get out of there. Um, the Union has taken none, and all the important locations are in Union hands. If you want to assess victory by <laughs> this scenario, it's very clear the Union has won this astoundingly, However, they failed to destroy the Confederate Army. They failed to even wreck Longstreet. They might have been able to do something significant to them if they could have gotten Burnside there. But here's the problem. This army's not cut off. That's always the problem with Civil War battles. Uh, the enemy... The, the losses aren't so high. You know, it's not like you wipe out the enemy on a, on a pursuit or anything like that. Uh, Certainly not in this terrain. <laughs> you might have been, you know, we could have seen a pursuit of this unit had, what's his name, uh, Hooker, had he chased that unit down, he could have finished that off if that was a larger force of ineffective units because the line was spread too thin in the battlefield. Yeah, sure. Um, but the system just doesn't uh, play out that way in general. So I'm going to send this one up. Um, at least you get kind of a flavor about what this battle does. I hope that the uh, after Santa Ana scenario is a little more interesting than this one. Because this one just does not show anything. I, it does not show a balanced battle in any sense. It doesn't show any reason that you'd want, um, that you'd want to play this in any competitive sense. And it doesn't show a whole lot about the about how the system adapts to this kind of situation. You still have this weird kind of situation where like, yeah, why am I falling back on Ringgold? Well, here there was some reason uh, to try to let Longstreet escape. That's the only thing that I could judge of any value um, in, in this whole, whole scenario is can you get out of, you can trivially get out of there with the Army of Tennessee. Can you get Longstreet out of there safely? You know, and, well, why can't he just wander up this way <laughs> and theoretically leave the map? Probably can, you know. Oh, so I don't know why you'd want to bring him down this way. I don't know what this is meant to represent. You know, I don't know what you're meant to show with this scenario, but. Once I had it set, once I figured out where the counters were all supposed to be and everything, I figured I might as well play it. But yeah, it's pretty much a waste. Uh, I can't recommend it for any reason, <laughs> particularly.